I have to continue my uh, parade of, of people to thank. Um, as I said before, our lunch sponsor was Cascade Natural Gas, which is the utility that delivers natural gas and energy efficiency uh, here in our region. And I just wanted to uh, invite Carrie Buren. It's a pleasure and a privilege to uh, sponsor the lunch today. Um, briefly, I was going to make uh, a few remarks from the Cascade Natural Gas Energy Efficiency uh, Team, which we aspire not to be an oxymoron. We serve approximately 60% of the households and businesses in Bellingham and the energy efficiency group sits in Bellingham um, primarily because of the very progressive and passionate culture around energy efficiency here and also um, because of the um, regional energy policy and um, energy technology research done at Western Washington. Uh, university through the Institute. We, uh, as the Energy Efficiency Organization, provide uh, rebates uh, for uh, high efficiency heating choices, and we also partner with uh, regional nonprofits looking at, uh, at energy efficiency, as well as um, having a history of support for. Uh, programs associated with Washington, Western Washington University. Um, we uh, are partnering with the Office of Sustainability for their uh, housing um, sustainability index, which we're, we're very excited about. Um, it's the intersection of high efficiency technology and human behavior, behavior which is uh, uh, a very complex equation. Uh, we were also um, the original members of the Women in Energy Mentoring Network. Yes, um, I see uh, several of the women here. It's some of our favorite work. Uh, we're currently uh, mentoring uh, four uh, women uh, in, in the network, and um, they are just uh, phenomenal. Uh, future leaders. So it's really exciting for us to be a part of that. Um, in addition, we're on the planning committee with uh, Western Washington for uh, looking at the uh, Bellingham Energy Innovation Hub. And um, that's, uh, that's a very exciting um, uh, future uh, initiative that we, we hope to be a part of. Um, uh, electricity is the theme of this, uh, of, of this particular symposium, but natural gas uh, has its place at the table and um, we, we want to be a part of uh, the solutions uh, that uh, are in play. Uh, whether that, uh, that mean, what that means for us in the long run remains to be seen, but we, we want to be uh, part of the discussion and we appreciated being invited here today. Um, we're looking forward to continuing our collaboration. We love Western Washington Energy Studies Institute and um, we're looking forward to continuing the dialogue around the dynamics of energy efficiency and energy usage in Washington. So thank you very much for uh, allowing us to be at the table and to host the luncheon. Enjoy. Thanks, Carrie. And as you can hear, uh, Cascade has really been uh, a great uh, collaborator. We've had uh, some of your colleagues come and speak in, in our classes, doing guest lectures. The Women in Energy Mentoring Network has been an important uh, activity, um, as, as well as working on the Energy Innovation Hub and, and the energy efficiency programs uh, in, in the, the city here. 
Um, so to introduce our lunch keynote speaker, I want to turn it back over to Ross. Hey, everybody. I'm going to keep this brief. Um, let us get to our lunch keynote. Just, I was thinking back as we were first brainstorming blue sky and what this conference could look like. We were saying, I wonder if we could get top experts from aviation, from freight, from, from uh, the electric vehicle and transportation sector, from nonprofits and businesses to be able to come here. I wonder if we could get the governor to do a morning keynote. Um, I wonder if we could get the top energy and climate blogger and writer in the country to be able to come give people his thoughts. And gosh, we're three for three on that. It, I really want to say that I think it's no exaggeration that uh, David Roberts, um, who currently writes for Vox.com, is the indispensable climate and clean energy writer. Uh, if you are so time poor as to have only one person who you follow, whether through Twitter, DR Vox, whether through uh, following him on Facebook, whether just getting the Vox feed, pick up this guy's stuff and I think you'll hear why. Uh, he's actually based here in Washington State, lives in Seattle, but writes nationally and globally on these issues and does a fabulous job of combining the urgency of making a rapid transition towards cleaner energy sources, toward to confronting the climate crisis and other crises of sustainability that we're facing, while never masking the complexity of the issues and the challenges that each individual sector is addressing or trying to gloss over the economic and technical and scientific and research and challenges that are needed there. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to David. It's been my great pleasure. You can either do it from there or here. What's your problem? Thank you. Hello. Welcome to Hogwarts. Can I get that turned off? I don't have any visuals. I'm anti-visual. Um, so I was listening to Eileen talk and it uh, occurred to me that I should have talked with Eileen before we came <laughs> to give talks. So I too am gonna give a, a, an overview, although I think what I'm gonna do is take a step even further back and try to sort of uh, frame where transportation uh, fits in the big decarbonization picture and what lies ahead uh, and just some general remarks uh, about it, just so I think uh, can, people can orient themselves for some of this more specific stuff that Eileen was talking about. So, uh, I, presumably everybody in this room gets uh, climate change, gets the severity of it, uh, gets the fact that we need to try to hold temperatures, uh, temperature rise beneath two degrees, 1.5 if possible, and understands that do it, doing that requires immediate, massive, rapid reductions in global carbon emissions. Uh, so <clears throat> the way I think about it is, uh, if you're balancing the, the, the risks of action, there is zero risk of overdoing it <laughs> on decarbonization. Um, so, uh, so we've made some progress on this a little bit. <laughs> We're, we've gotten started. You might have noticed uh, the IEA uh, said the other day that global carbon emissions have plateaued now for three years. At least they've temporarily stopped rising uh, and, and they're declining in some countries, particularly developed, uh, particularly, uh, developed countries are in the US. Uh, but so far, almost all progress made on clean energy, globally speaking, in terms of really substantially uh, 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 mitigating carbon emissions, is in electricity, is, in, uh, is, is through solar and wind. Mainly solar and wind, and then also <coughs> efficiency has held demand down, especially in, in, in developed countries. Um, and, 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 you know, the, the whole um, 
all the complements that make for a clean grid. So solar and wind are at the center of it, but there's batteries and, and storage and all the rest of it. So, but, but basically, almost all progress has been made in electricity. Uh, so let's take a look at the US, for instance. I feel like the US recently passed a highly symbolic threshold. So from, from, from the 50s on, 70s on, you look, at, you look at graphs of electricity, sector emissions, and transportation sector emissions in the US, and they're basically both going up like this with electricity substantially, not substantially, higher. They're both around a third, but electricity is a, a bigger third, let's say, uh, mainly because of coal. And so lately, we've been, um, we've had a stroke of luck in the electricity sector in that, uh, environmentalists hate when I say this, but in that we've had a ginormous flood of cheap natural gas, thanks to fracking, which uh, has been taking coal out and creating room for wind and solar to expand without posing any particular grid difficulties because natural gas turns out to be a, an excellent balancing complement to renewable energy. So at least in terms of electricity, we're on the road. The giant boulder is rolling <laughs> slowly. Uh, that's, that's gonna get harder uh, later on, because the strategy we're using now, which is replacing coal with natural gas while we ramp up renewables, uh, gets you only so far, if you're trying to get to zero carbon, as we are, eventually the natural gas has got to go. Sorry to, to our sponsors. Uh, <laughs> natural gas is a fossil fuel. It, it emits carbon. So to get to zero carbon, it's got to go, or all be uh, uh, put CCS, uh, carbon capture, on all of it. So that's going to be a fight. <laughs> but, but for now, we've got a, a long runway ahead of us in electricity to continue reducing emissions. Meanwhile, transportation is the other big bucket, uh, uh, the other primary bucket of emissions. And if you look at uh, graphs of American energy use going back uh, to, to mid-century, what you basically discover is that transportation is just as dependent on petroleum today as it was in 1950, as it was in 1970, as it always has been. Uh, so anyway, oh, the symbolic threshold. I'm sorry, I left you hanging on that. The symbolic threshold that the US just passed was Last year, in 2016, for the first time in, in decades, in, in modern memory, uh, electricity sector emissions dipped below transportation sector emissions. So transportation sector emissions are officially the biggest carbon problem in the US now. And furthermore, the electricity emissions are on the right trajectory, whereas Transportation emissions are, are not uh, uh, declining. So, um, all of which is to say, it, um, transportation is the big climate fight now. It's been kind of put off and put off because electricity is much easier. Uh, but, but to get to anything like the, the um, ambitious goals that we have uh, on record, we've got to tackle transportation. Um, <clears throat> so. I think the transportation fight is going to be, uh, in a lot of ways, more difficult than the electricity fight. I almost feel, as weird as it sounds to say, I almost feel like electricity has been so easy uh, that we've gotten a little overconfident and over our skis as to how much progress we're making and, and how wonderful everything is. Uh, transportation remains a huge and almost entirely unsolved uh, uh, carbon problem. So three ways uh, in particular that I think uh, the transportation uh, problem is different than the electricity problem. Uh, one is it's not, we don't know what the path to zero carbon looks like. In electricity, um, you know, there's a lot of dispute about the details once you get to 80%, 90% decarbonization, but more or less we see a pathway 
in electricity to zero carbon. You ramp up wind and solar, toward the end, you start phasing out natural gas for other balancing mechanisms, dispatchable demand, uh, uh, storage, maybe some synthetic gas, uh, various and sundry things, maybe some nuclear, keep some nuclear around, at least don't close the nuclear we already have, um, so forth. So there's a road to zero carbon in electricity. Um, it's a long and difficult road. I don't want to undersell that, but it's, but it's a road and it's visible. In transportation, we don't really know what that road is. Um, and I think there are two big options uh, that, that I go back and forth on. Uh, one is uh, electrification, which has been mentioned several times. So if you have a pathway to zero carbon in electricity and you don't have one in transportation, just pull transportation into electricity, hitch its, hitch its wagon to electricity, and then it can ride electricity to zero carbon. That would mean uh, uh, electrifying vehicles, uh, obviously on, a, on an enormous and very rapid scale. Um, a lot to recommend this road, which I'm not gonna get too deeply into because I wanna leave time for questions, but there's a lot to recommend electrification, not only in terms of uh, its viability, its technical viability, but also in terms of consumer benefit and also in terms of um, its uh, complementary, it's complementary to a clean grid. Having an enormous number of electrified vehicles is helpful on the grid. You've got this storage, energy storage, distributed energy storage that can absorb excess energy when it comes, release it when it's needed, uh, and serve as, as controllable, dispatchable uh, demand too. So it's, it's helpful having those batteries. It's helpful in uh, uh, bringing more renewable energy onto the grid. So those are complementary strategies and still the one kind of on balance, I think, I favor. Uh, but it's got some problems too. Um, A, it will radically increase electricity demand, so it will obviously increase the pressure to find more clean electricity. Um, and, and B, as, as Eileen so uh, uh, aptly uh, summarized, there are, are transportation applications that we do not yet know how to electrify or whether we'll be able to electrify them, mainly heavy, really big, heavy, high power stuff, big trucks, uh, especially airplanes. Although there are now electric airplanes uh, uh, being fiddled with, but uh, that's, that's, probably not gonna, we're, that's probably not gonna pay out. Um, so the other, <clears throat> the other big option, which I'll, I'll just go over uh, uh, briefly, is some sort of zero carbon natural gas alternative, some sort of alternative liquid fuel. So um, biogas, for instance, which is uh, a gas made from uh, leftover biomass. They're big into that in Germany. There's hydrogen, which was mentioned uh, uh, earlier. There's also uh, what's called synthetic natural gas, where you take sunlight and CO2 and hydrogen and make uh, gas out of them. That would give you a way to absorb excess CO2 if, for instance, you were capturing it from power plants. Instead of just burying it, you could combine it with hydrogen and sunlight to create uh, zero carbon natural gas. The great advantage of something like that, synthetic gas, is <coughs> twofold. Uh, one, we already have a gigantic storage infrastructure built. We have a natural gas pipeline system built and synthetic gas can be stored in those pipelines. So if, for instance, you build uh, a ton of wind and solar, right? At certain points, you're gonna have way more energy than you need during windy and sunny periods. What do you do with all that excess energy? You can either curtail those power plants turn them down, waste that energy, or you find something to do with all that energy. So if you could take all that excess renewable energy and use it to create synthetic gas, you would effectively have found, um, it would be a, a form of energy storage. 
And, and what's more, it would be a form of energy storage that we really need because the energy storage we have right now available to us is mostly minute by minute, hour by hour, short term storage. But if we're going to go all or mostly renewable energy, wind and solar, we're going to have to contend with times when wind and solar are lower than average for a month or for six months or for a year <clears throat> or two years. So you need some form of long-term massive energy storage. And we don't really have that yet. Like if you combine all, I don't know if you guys know what pumped hydro is. It's a form of energy storage where they pump water uphill and then when they need the energy back, they run it downhill through, through generators. It is the largest form of energy storage currently in the US, but if you combine the top 10 biggest pumped hydro facilities in the US, together they can hold about 42 minutes of US, average US electricity use. So if we're gonna go ramp up renewables in the electricity system, we need some sort of uh, form of long-term storage. So synthetic gas would be great for that, it would also could be used to run power plants to provide that balancing also. It could also potentially be used in vehicles uh, because the, the, the storage infrastructure is there. You'd have, to, you'd have to deal with pumping infrastructure and stuff like that. Anyway, the whole point being the road to zero carbon transportation is, is hazy. <laughs> and uncertain yet, so there's a lot of experimentation to do. We need a lot of uh, 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 small projects, we need a lot of research, we need a lot of demonstration projects, and we need to get started really quick because like we're overdue. Like we need to start dropping transportation uh, uh, emissions immediately and all the tools we currently have, like CAFE standards, reduce them, but reducing and getting to zero are not just different in degree, they're different in kind. You need different kinds of technologies and we don't know what that technology is exactly yet to get to zero carbon uh, transportation. That's the first difference. Uh, second difference from electricity is, I don't feel like we really have a great uh, grasp of what policies are gonna work either. We have a much better sense in electricity uh, uh, how to get there. You just keep ramping up, forcing more and more renewable energy on, you trade the coal out for natural gas, then you get rid of natural gas. Uh, but, but basically, renewable energy standards, uh, any form of carbon pricing hits electricity first, hits coal first, really. Uh, uh, carbon pricing um, hits uh, electricity well before it hits transportation. You have to jack up a carbon price really, really high before it starts really biting in the transportation sector. So again, like we know the policies to incrementally reduce uh, emissions from transportation, but, <clears throat> but unlike in electricity where you're sort of trying to push substitution of more or less equivalent products, which is exactly what pricing is good for, in transportation, it looks like you need not just incremental but a phase shift, a shift from one system to a different system. A system based on gasoline cars to a system based on electric cars. Those are not just, that's not just a matter of putting more electric cars on the road. You need, you need infrastructure, you need fueling stations, you need policy all around that. So how do you induce via public policy uh, a, more or less an industrial revolution in a sector, not just substitution, but, but, but uh, you know, sort of wholesale uh, revision of the entire structure of the sector. Uh, we don't really know how to do that very well. And furthermore, we live in a political culture that is highly, uh, uh, let's just say, averse to overtly activist government or a, a big government or whatever the hell you want to call it. And, 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 and saying to an industry, switch out your industrial base for a different industrial base is, is big government. There's no, <clears throat> there's no real way around that. So, so we're sort of uh, a little bit in the dark about 
the technology, not in the dark, but there's lots of options, but hazy about the technology, and we're a little hazy about the policy too, especially relative to the very well-developed and well-tested and endlessly hashed over uh, policies that we have in the electricity sector. Uh, so that's the second difference. Third difference, and then I'll shut up and, and take questions. Um, the third difference is that we were lucky in electricity in that um, natural gas came in super cheap uh, and put coal back on its heels. And so coal was, um, by the time we really needed to start bashing on it, already pretty weak and not particularly able to defend itself very well. The market was doing most of the work for us and, the, and policies were sort of uh, 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 accelerating what the market was already doing. So this has meant that coal's ability politically to fight and stop stuff has been pretty limited. It's, it's getting beat up everywhere until Donald Trump and his weird fetish for coal miners <laughs> entered the picture. Uh, by the way, here's my statistic that I tweeted the other day that people always like hearing. There are today 50,000, roughly, about 50,200 uh, coal miners working in the United States as of, I think, March of this year, whereas the U.S. solar industry created 51,000 new jobs in 2016 alone. Uh, any, anywho, uh, so coal, coal politically is not that big. Uh, oil is a different <laughs> beast entirely. Um, if you're going after transportation emissions, you are going after oil, and you are going after, in the US, the largest single use of, of petroleum. Uh, uh, worldwide, I think, the, the largest single use of petroleum. So you're going directly after oil's bottom line. And oil is not just oil, oil is oil and gas. So it's got the, the power of being the, the, the sort of uh, golden child of the electricity sector, and then the power of being central and vital to the transportation sector. More money than God, globally coordinated, enormous, enormous political power in the oil industry. And I think the fight against oil is going to make the fight against coal look like patty cakes. I think uh, the, this, will be, this will be the time when it will become, I think, very clear that decarbonization cannot be accomplished by the environmental movement, that ultimately, we either have to make a society-wide <coughs> uh, decision to do this or we don't, because there's no conceivable world in which the U.S. environmental movement is at all equipped to take on the U.S. oil industry. <laughs> uh, and I think you can already sort of see that, <coughs> see that playing out even in state battles where, uh, you know, a lot of electricity battles are being won, but like, look, Look at, the, look at the battle over the low carbon fuel standard in California. Look at what happened in Washington where, uh, you know, everybody's singing kumbaya about reducing electricity sector emissions, but when the governor tried to put a low carbon fuel standard in place and actually go after the oil industry, all of a sudden, all hell broke loose. So, and what's more, oil is powerful in those states where coal is really weak and, and renewable energy and electricity is really powerful, like California, for instance. So you look at California's energy graphs over time, you see coal shrinking, you see renewables growing, and you just see petroleum 100% staying steady from, from prehistory until today. So, uh, so those are the three differences, I think. A, we're not that clear on the technological road to zero carbon. B, we're not that clear on the policy road to zero carbon in transportation. And C, it is going to be a political battle that, uh, that is going to make uh, uh, what came before it, I think, look like smooth sailing. So it's a huge, it is a huge problem and it is the huge carbon 
problem right now, so uh, I, I, I'm happy that I get to talk to rooms full of smart people who are trying to solve it. Uh, that's all. Happy to take a few questions. Yeah, sure. I don't know how much. Just yell at me when I need it. I'd like to uh, comment that our moderator this morning said our biggest obstacle is political will. I want to reinforce that notion because we've had the technology for quite a few years to make most of these transitions, in my view. And I want to say that, that as a, a proud leaf owner, <laughs> my wife and I argue over who gets to drive it because it's so much fun to drive. It's the fastest car from zero to 60 that I've ever owned. And it, frankly, it's just fun to drive. And it's so silent when you stop at a stop sign, you can hear the birds sing. It's a lovely <laughs> thing, really. And it's like driving, a, like driving a go kart. You go through a traffic circle and you just flat around the turn. So it's fun. But the point in that is that if we're going, we cannot tackle the oil industry in Congress. Congress has been the enemy of reform for many, many years. I've lived through the rollbacks of cafe standards, and I know what they do change of administration, you change your cafe standards over and over again. So we cannot depend on the U.S. Congress to help us. So I think that what we have to do is each and every one of us has to vote with our pocketbook and go out and buy an electric car. Say that you got to cut off the head of the snake. That's the only way you're going to stop the oil industry. Uh, yeah, that's, I, I, I think that um much as the market has been enormously helpful in decarbonizing electricity, only when the market begins moving in a serious way will the fight against transportation emissions really uh, take off. You can't generate that from nothing. So my, my take, though, is we can kickstart those markets. You're not going to see it happen at the federal level probably, but I, but I always think that the story of CAFE standards is incredibly instructive. Um, you had it start in, <coughs> or, or not CAFE standards, but California's alternative CAFE standards. You sort of had this one state say, we want to go beyond. And they got this waiver and went beyond. And then other states started joining them until eventually about half the U.S. states had one set of fuel efficiency standards and the other half had another set. And eventually automakers said, fine, uncle, we're not going to make two sets of cars for the country. Let's get together at the federal level and, and, and hash this out so we can all come to something we can all agree on. It was all working great until uh, recent events. But I think it demonstrates that um, states joining with other states is a real path to nationwide policy. I think that can, I, I think that's the only way we're ever going to get anything like a nationwide uh, uh, carbon pricing system. And, and, it's, and it goes the same for the electric car market. So you've got to start somewhere in a concentrated form, really standing it up and, and starting to get some uh, efficiencies of scale, starting to drive down prices, because there are certain places where you can rely on consumer goodwill, uh, let's say, but you're not going to get to the finish line on consumer goodwill. So eventually you just have to just mechanically, by hook or crook, juice that market into existence in certain states or regions and then watch it spread uh, from there. So I don't, think, uh, I don't think we have to wait for the market. I think we can, uh, we can use markets to our advantage. Thank you. Anyone? Hi. Uh, my name's Aiden. I'm an Energy Institute student here. And uh, I'm Eric. We basically have the same question. Yeah. So. Uh, is this like a duet? <laughs> our, question, <laughs> our question's on communication. In a time where we're awash in media with different reputable sources, some true, some not, and where a lot of what we're doing here is communicating these strategies, ideas, and pathways to the future, as well as opportunities to collaborate. How do we get the word out? How do we say, this is what's actually going on, this is what we're doing? And yeah. yeah. How, do we, how do we keep people who aren't interested in that 
focus on things that matter? Like, how do, how do you approach that situation? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I knew the answer to that question. <laughs> Uh, I, re I recently, I if you'd like the tediously long version of an answer to that question, I recently wrote a post uh, about what I call tribal epistemology, a headline that scared away 98% of readers, but it's actually a, an interesting post, I think. But, <clears throat> but it's about the long road we've been down uh, uh, of media fragmenting and, 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 and the main force of that being the U.S. right wing more or less hiving off into an insular, sealed, epistemological bubble and convincing its audience that U.S. institutions cannot be trusted. Science can't be trusted, academia can't be trusted, media can't be trusted, only right wing media can be trusted. And now we have 30 million Americans who believe that who have basically become their own freestanding <laughs> Uh, fact pattern, you know, we, we're now operating from two different fact patterns. How to solve that, I have no idea. Um, but I do think that it's possible to talk to people about these challenges in a way that uh, dodges some of those hot button issues and, and, and just engages human curiosity and, hu and human ambition and, and, and a sense uh, that I think has been lost and diminished that the U.S. Uh, is not just powerful because it's great and great because it's powerful. It does good things. It leads. It solves problems, right? And this is a huge global problem. And so, <clears throat> I mean, my feeling has sort of been that the U.S. environmental movement has been for a long time mostly about no, 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 fighting, fighting, fighting mostly trying to rub the rough edges off of industrial civilization, basically. That's been its role. And it's become very well-worn in a groove in that role. It's always the third paragraph of the story in the New York Times, you know, where, whereas environmentalists said, no, this is horrible, and everybody just glazes right over it. Um, I really think we're reaching a time now when uh, 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 activists and advocates and, and people who care about uh, uh, clean energy and stuff like that have a, are beginning to have a positive story to tell. Uh, uh, something they want, something they're going toward rather than just things they hate and are fighting. So there's a sort of vision coming clear now of, of an electrified world where your, your car is plugged in to your home, your home is smart, it's plugged into your solar panels, they're plugged into a smart microgrid. You've got all these sort of futuristic widgets. It's actually like an interesting consumer experience. It's like better. It's a, it, uh, it, you know, as the gentleman said, an electric car is better. It's more fun to drive. So I actually think rather than just less of this, less of that, less of that, which has been the environmentalist mantra for, for decades, we now have um, a different kind of message, which is this sucks. That's way better. Let's do that, uh, which, is, which is a positive message that environmentalism has been lacking. So, so I would just, you know, I, I, when I try to talk to people, I try to engage their spirit of sort of ambition and, and, and technological ambition and, and social ambition, ambition to make America great again, to, to coin a phrase, uh, and, and less about culture war issues. I think it's possible to talk about this stuff mostly dodging tedious culture war issues. Thank you. I hope that's helpful at all. The longer version's online. <laughs> I should have. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Alexa. I'm an environmental and energy policy student. Um, my question has to do with, so electrification of the transportation system is the future, but shouldn't we invest in a smart grid first to have the energy storage and the efficiency, I guess? Well, yes. It's all got to happen in tandem, I think, is, is the way to look at it. So <clears throat> um, there's pushing wind and solar on the grid then there's a whole suite of things that you have to do to accommodate wind and solar on the grid. Because right now the grid is not structured yeah. 
to accommodate high amounts. So almost all of that suite has to do with flexibility options. So smart grid makes cities uh, and energy management more efficient. You get solar, you get uh, uh, automated um, energy management at the building level, at the microgrid level. A lot of it, this stuff can be automated over time. You need a bunch of storage on the grid and then you also need, um, to the extent we can fig figure it out, as much zero carbon dispatchable generation as possible. Dispatchable just means you can turn it on and off when you want to, which you can't with the wind and, su and sun. So that could be geothermal, it's hydro, it's maybe synthetic gas, but, but, but we don't have time to do that <laughs> and, then, and then do the other thing. Basically, I think right now, the latest analysis I saw maybe from the uh, uh, concerned scientists, UCS, was that um, it's, it's an environmental benefit to switch from a gasoline car to an electric car in every state now, I think. I think that's right, or every one but one, or something like that. It's almost, almost everywhere already it's better to have an electric car. And, 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 and as uh, someone mentioned earlier, which is a point I really like making because I think it's, it, it, it makes the uh, benefits of electricity vivid, um, you want to improve the, the uh, environmental performance of a gas car, there's only one opportunity to do that, and that's when you're designing and building the car, right? And from then on, it, it consumes what it consumes. Whereas you build an electric car, every increment that the grid gets cleaner, that car gets cleaner. So you're pulling one lever here, making the grid cleaner, and you are improving environmental performance in every electronic device in the, in the world at the same time. So it just gives you, um, like I said, that road to zero carbon, that road to get the the lever all the way down and you don't have to wait until you have the perfect zero carbon car, you have a zero carbon ready car <laughs> in every electric vehicle, right? So once, so once the electric vehicles are in place, you crank the carbon out of electricity and it goes out of all the cars too. So, so I don't think, we definitely have to do them in tandem, but I don't think there's any reason to wait. I think already electrification has enormous benefits even, even today. Hello, uh, my name is Witt. I'm an energy science major. Um, and I've got uh, just a really short question and a different question. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, what, uh, what percentage of the market would you expect to see EVs reach before the oil industry takes an actual stance against EVs, if ever, if that's possible? Uh. 27. Uh, I don't know, but, but uh, uh, Bloomberg New Energy Finance uh, released a great report uh, last year that, that made the point that electrification of vehicles is going to displace as much oil demand as the uh, late 70s oil crisis at something like 4 to 5% penetration, right, which is coming soon, and then it just keeps going up, right, so, so I've been somewhat mystified that the oil industry is not panicking yet about, <laughs> about this, but I suspect said panic will arrive any day now. Awesome. Um, and if it's okay. No, go ahead. Um, uh, I, recently, I was looking at power to gas, which is uh, syn gas, essentially. Um, and in combination with compressed air energy storage, specifically in um, Washington, and there's actually a location that would work pretty darn well. Um, it already has natural gas pipeline along the way, and I assume storage would be relatively easy. But then uh, a kind of a fundamental question came up how do you incentivize people to build that when it's gonna cost a ton of money up front? It's gonna cost a ton just to make the natural gas even though natural gas right now is so cheap. How do you incentivize 
building stuff like that for way off in the future when right now is so cheap in terms of natural gas costs? Yeah, that's, that's the $6 million question. I mean, <clears throat> the canned answer is put a price on carbon. Yeah. Uh, I, I actually think um, that that is a bad canned answer most of the time. Uh, I think uh, uh, the way to think of a price on carbon is like uh, an extra degree of gravity, right? People aren't really going to notice it that much. It will have effects, but, but, but if you want targeted, large-scale, expensive action like that, you need more targeted policies. I mean, the, what you have to do is, A, make being carbon-intensive expensive. That's how you, that's how you make uh, uh, bio, syngas pay off eventually. And B, you have to have electricity sector reforms, which I could talk about until you were bored to tears. Probably take about a minute and a half. Uh, but you have to have electricity uh, uh, sector reforms that value the various energy services that different technologies can offer the grid. So right now, we more or less pay for power, right? We pay for electricity on, on wholesale markets. Some markets also pay for capacity, which is sort of like spare, spare capacity. But there are all sorts of services that the grid needs that various technologies can provide, storage being one of them, frequency, uh, you know, regulation, um, short and long-term storage actually are different products. Uh, storage for arbitrage is different from uh, storage for seasonal, whatever. Point being, um, you just have to change markets so those things become valuable. I think you might have to sort of brute force the first few like, you know, projects or demonstrations uh, or whatever, but ultimately you got, to, you got to reform electricity so that it is, the market is demanding and valuing the various services that different technologies provide so those technologies can get a market signal and, and, and grow. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ryan. I'm an economics student here. Uh, I was wondering if you could comment a little more on, you said that a carbon tax is better for reducing emissions from the electricity generation sector than the transportation sector. I wonder if you just touch on that a little more. Sure, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think the, the easiest way to um, explain it is just that Coal, insofar as it has an economic advantage over other generation sources, it is slim, right? Super slim. And, and a little bit of <laughs> tax is enough to, to, to flip it. Uh, uh, and secondly, it's got this massive competitor, natural gas, that's right on its heels that is much less carbon intensive. So again, any like that race is so close that it just doesn't take much to, to give, to put coal at, at a disadvantage. So you can prompt a pretty massive coal exit with a pretty reasonable carbon price. Whereas um, uh, a carbon price of, of $100, let's say, a ton, higher than anybody is discussing, Raise it, would raise the price of a gallon of gasoline about a buck. So that is not nothing, and it would not have no effect, but you might have noticed, if you've been a driver for a few years, gas prices flip up and down by more than that for all sorts of reasons all the time, and people just absorb it and go on, more or less go on driving. They might scale back driving a little bit, but they don't like if gas went up from $3 a gallon to $4 a gallon, you would not be enough to prompt a bunch of people to go out and buy new cars, right? So you need, um, it's a combination of the signal gets weak by the time it reaches gasoline and, and, and the fact that you need a really substantial kick in the pants to get people to, to, uh, to act on that. So, so all of which is just to say, I think the right way to think about carbon pricing in the short to midterm is a stake through coal's heart, 
which is, you know, praise be. There's nothing wrong with that at all. But I just think you are going to ultimately have to approach the transportation sector as its own thing, requiring its own policies, and not think of a carbon tax as a substitute for transportation policy. Great, thanks. Hi, my name is Sharon Shoemake. I'm an economics professor here at Western. And I would argue that your answer to Ryan's question is, first of all, a feature of a carbon tax, not necessarily a problem with it. That if there's a lot of cheap ways of reducing our yeah, CO2 right. emissions from coal, then we should very much do those first. Mm -hmm. And that transportation, if there's not a good substitute, that's something we should do later on and maybe only until we need to get a carbon tax of 100 or $200 a ton. But I also wanted I'm to make the- I'm quibble with that, by the way. Put, put, a, <laughs> put a pin in that. All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would also argue that there are more friends than you necessarily acknowledge, I mean maybe you just weren't going that in depth, in terms of decarbonizing cars. And that's if you look at the external costs of light duty vehicles, carbon emissions are only a small portion of that. So if you look at the external costs, then a gallon of gasoline should be about $1.75 was the last study that I saw more than what it is right now. And the biggest third of that is congestion. So when we drive our cars, we're slowing everyone else down on the road, and we're wasting billions of hours sitting in our cars. The next thing um, is actually accidents. So we're also increasing the probability that other people are going to get into an accident. The next thing after that, it's still air pollution. And then an order of magnitude smaller are greenhouse gas emissions, and depending on how you calculate the cost of wars in Iraq, oil dependency. Um, and so. I think when sometimes people talk about decarbonization of cars, I think that's interesting, but it's more about the behavior. And there's so many friends that we can make of, well, if we start some sort of congestion pricing, then we can save everyone's time. And this is how you'll benefit. I think the carbon costs of this are really a small piece of that. Uh, um, can I answer that or are we in a rush? Um, uh, yes, yes to all that. Uh, um, and, and the, the, the uh, air pollution the local air pollution externalities are also way, way higher than the carbon externalities. So uh, air pollution regs are a mechanism for driving it, carbon out of transportation, as is congestion pricing. If you can figure out how to make that more popular, I w the world would. So our experience with that has made it more popular, though. So when Stockholm suggested doing congestion pricing, everyone voted no. Then they had an experiment when they ran it for a while. They had another vote, and people overwhelmingly supported it afterwards. Yeah, yeah. So I think uh, that, and, and, if, and if you take maybe that as like a, a stand-in for urban policy more, more broadly, uh, helping people live closer to where they work, et cetera, et cetera, helping people drive less, obviously a huge, huge part of the solution. But that, I just don't see that being big and fast, right? I, I think that's got to happen, and I'm a huge, huge advocate for it. But, 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 e but even that, you're going to get less cars. You know, it's about, it, it, again, it's about getting to zero, right? Like, there's so many ways to get lower, like you say, tons of ways to, to, to get lower at the margins. It's, it's getting to zero that is the, that is the dilemma. Um, just really quickly on the carbon tax point. <laughs> uh, um, uh, in terms of, of standard economics, that's totally right. Like, the whole virtue of a carbon price is that it goes after the, the biggest carbon sources first, right? Like, that's the point. It goes after the cheapest reductions first. That's why it's economically efficient. That's why economists uh, love it. And, 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 and it's true that it, is, um, that it is efficient in that sense. But I think um, when you're talking about a system <clears throat> where eventually you know you're gonna have to make system changes, right? Not just sort of like tweaks to the vehicles, but a new transportation system, like an electronic, an electric, that, that means electric vehicles, it means charging stations, it could mean wireless charging built into infrastructure, it could mean uh, much more easily uh, shared vehicles, especially if AVs come along. If you know that eventually you're going to have to do that, um, it's just not clear. Like, I, I feel like if you just have a mild carbon tax, you, you put it off and put it off and put it off until all of a sudden you need something big and radical and, and super fast, right? And then suddenly your carbon tax, to achieve it, 
has to ramp up and up and up and up and up to politically unrealistic levels, right? So I just think that advanced work in technology and policy uh, um, can, can lower the, 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 the stakes of a carbon price. It can make a carbon price's job easier. Let's put it that way. We can continue this outside. Uh, yeah, I think they're right. So I want to continue my cavalcade of thanks. Um, if possible, I've been bragging about our Stellar Energy Advisory Board. Could I just ask the members of our advisory board for the Institute for Energy Studies to stand up and let us recognize you? Uh, Ross, William Johnston from Electric Power Research Institute, Warren, you met earlier. Where's Dave Benson? Did he slip out? Tony Usabelli, uh, Bill Hurley, yeah, hi Bill. Uh, let's see, where was Lars? Lars Johansson? Okay, well anyway, give them all a hand. There's Tony. We'll hear from Tony later. And I wanted... I also wanted to specifically recognize Ross as our program chair. We have a, uh, a memento here of, of your prowess in uh, energy symposium management and uh, feline orchestration. <laughs> Uh, because you had to do a lot of that uh, during uh, the organization. And with that, I will turn it back over to Ross to conduct the orchestra for our next panel. We're doing planes, trains, and automobiles, so planes is next. <laughs>